My name is Scott Chaloner and you are listening to the Leaders' Council podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. You join us on a very grey spring morning here in the capital today. And for those regular listeners to the show, you will understand that part of our mission here at the Leaders' Council and indeed on this programme is to bring forward a variety of distinct perspectives on leadership. And today that mission takes us to Birmingham to Reverend Dr. Carver Anderson, today's guest. He is the executive director and co-founder of the Bringing Hope charity that works in prisons and the community with those involved in serious violence and crime. Um, Carver, very warm welcome to you today and by all means, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you so very much, Scott, and it's just good to be here with you, so to speak, um, virtually, um, and just want to say hi to all the listeners. I'm hoping they're doing well and safe. Fantastic, and certainly so after a turbulent couple of uh, years that we've uh, that we've certainly had. Um, for you, that's two out of twenty five years working in the fields of social community youth work, counselling, and training. So, obviously, the the last couple of years aside with the COVID situation, you must have seen an incredible amount in that time, given the people that you work with. Absolutely, so Scott. You know, um, I am a man of faith, um, but I'm also a very pragmatic. I'm a social scientist and a practical theologian. So over the years, I have gone through many, many engagement encounters, challenges, and highs in terms of um, seeing things that I've celebrated. But you know what, Scott? It's a journey because human life, which we are wanting to flourish, I've seen some of those lives literally take a nosedive into destruction into annihilation, if you please. And over the years, I've buried quite a few people, um, some to violence, some to natural causes. And the thing for me is that as a minister, because I'm a clergy also, who seek to show love, care, concern, compassion, forgiveness, empower, all those things, you know, which is in my, my safe toolbox, uh, which came in very, very prominent during the pandemic, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. So in the past 25 years, I've worked in, in prison, in communities with individuals, families, because we're, as an organization, we're very family orientated. And you know, the thing is, Scott, families are important to people, even though some of them are fractured. Mm. Um, love is also important and affirmation is important. And we do our best to reconfigure, reconstruct certain fractured situations that we can have a solution to help people to have a, a better life, a more productive life, really. So for the past number of years, I've been on this journey and have gone through pain where I've been fearful myself in some of the situations because there's times, you know, tears are a language also, mm. as well as the, the voice and the conversation. So let me just put a full stop at that. Um, bit at this point, um, Scott. Yeah, absolutely fine. And um, I can imagine that sort of that desire to take people away from, you know, that kind of life, that destitution and sort of bringing them back into the light, as it were, making their lives better. That was probably one of the main motivations behind establishing Bringing Hope 18 years ago, wasn't it? Indeed, indeed. I mean, at, at, at the time when Bringing Hope was established, there was a state of real serious violence. There was issues about guns and um, gang-associated violence and so on. And Bring Hope was established at the time when we said to faith leaders, church leaders in particular, we need to work together because most of our churches are in communities that are going through a very difficult time with crime, violence and so on. And if you think about the country, uh, from north to south, east and west, a lot of our churches are in situations or in areas that are struggling. And Bringing Hope emerged out of that pain. And one of my colleagues, um, Reverend Robin Thompson, who's one of the founding members also, you know, he had people that had been lost to serious violence. Um, so have I. And bringing hope then is saying, how do we respond with strategic, 
with faith, with pragmatic, and with approaches that can bring a solution to the deep-rooted causes of crime and violence and so on. I'm, I'm not saying that there's any quick fixes to this. However, I believe that there are approaches and models that have been tested that they work. So Bringing Hope is one of a number of organizations but that seeks to engage with individuals, families, uh, and communities that are associated with serious violence. So clearly, we work alongside the Violence Reduction Unit, the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office, the Probation Service. So we work independently, but also in partnership, because we believe that there's no one organization, no one model, no one approach that can bring a solution. So it clearly has to be interdisciplinary um, and multifaceted, really, um, Scott. Yeah, certainly makes sense from my perspective. And it is a very much kind of community led sort of public health and faith based approach that you take to responding to sort of those challenges, those crisis situations. Um, What sort of challenges do you sort of encounter with taking this approach? Because especially where you sort of engage somebody with a faith based approach, I can imagine that for certainly someone who's had a history of violence, that might be greeted with a certain level of scepticism that you also have to address. Well, w- w- what is important here, Scott? So, there, I'm also looking through public theological lenses. So, mm. we don't proselytize. In other words, we don't ask people to become people of faith necessarily. However, we go into our faith toolkit, and what does that mean? It means that we bring love and and care and humility and integrity and look at issues of forgiveness and support. So faith-based approaches, yes, it's rooted in my my Christian faith, but it literally uses some key things that are ethical. They're ethical. They're good practice models. Mm. Um, And when we get down, you know, for example, What does it mean to love? Love is an intentional act to care for someone's welfare and well-being without wanting anything back necessarily apart from saying, I want you to be in a better place. Now, people who are entrenched with issues, whether it's violence or drugs or whatever the issues are, we're saying we've got to go alongside them. And because we're a family orientated organization, we literally engage with family members, which is natural family and also street family members. And yes, some of them are skeptical if they know we're a Christian organization, but because that's not what we are seeking them to come into faith in that way, but we're seeking to use our faith, faith in action, if you please, to act in ways that support and care for them. And people know in the long run if we are genuine or not, you know, Scott. People can pick it up very, very quickly if we are genuine or not. Mm. There's a saying in our in our community that real knows real. So when something real comes to you, you know what is real, so to speak. So yes, I understand that there's certain people who are cautious, skeptical, but even in this cautiousness and the skepticism, we work beyond that, that we show that through relationship building that is genuine, that trust and develop, really. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it, what happens when you engage and you break down those barriers. And I think that that certainly has been no more important than it has been over the year, the last couple of years when we've really sort of realized through the pandemic the value of being engaged with by our fellow human beings, the value of communication, of interaction. Obviously, from an operational perspective, the pandemic will have thrown up a hell of a lot of challenges for you. How was it that you sort of responded to that and sought to continue your work despite everything that uh, COVID threw up? Right. Thanks for that, um, Scott, that question. It was a very, very challenging two years and has it still is challenging. But I mean, at the height of the pandemic, where we are 
still crime didn't stop necessarily. You know, so people didn't say because we we're on the restriction we won't be going out. People were still going out. Mm. Some of the people that we've worked with who are in prison, so we've had to develop a new way of working. You know, via the social media platforms, via um, email a prisoner, for example. So we had an, uh, an account with email a prisoner, so we'd email prisoners. And we would literally be out because we were classed as um, essential workers because of the work we do. So we had letters from the police and crime commissioner's office that if we were stopped by the police and we were involved in a, in a case, Mm. that we would not be prosecuted, if you please. You know, it's interesting talking about prosecution now with what's happening with the government. Mm. Um, but we literally ensured that we upheld the policies, the procedures, the social distancing procedures, and so on. It wasn't easy. For example, I did a number of funerals during the pandemic, um, Scott. And as a clergy, some funerals I did when it was at the height only five people had to be there. And this was a very popular individual or individuals. And there was almost friction in the family to say, well, why are you there, not me? So I had to deal with some very critical relationship um, challenges for families who wanted to bury their loved one, but they couldn't be there. And those families who couldn't even go to the hospitals and so on. So part of um, my work during the pandemic was to support individuals and families who lost loved ones. Some of it was through violence and other through um, um, other um, reasons for death. But that was very stressful for families. I too lost family members during the pandemic. Um, so I know at least 20 odd people from the African and Caribbean communities that I'm a part of that died in the pandemic. And as we know, um, Scott, the whole notion of disproportionality mm. um, was very heightened during the pandemic. So yes, it was a difficult time, but you know what I, I found during this period is the um, support that people wanted to give to each other, whether it was a phone call, it was for me, uh, just a ring up and just giving a prayer, even um, because of the man of faith and as a, from a faith tradition, um, prayer was important for some people. Those people in particular who were living alone, um, who we got involved with during the pandemic, and so churches um, worked to ensure that people, not just their parishioners or their members, but others who are associates would be supported during the pandemic period. And some people were lonely, um, but we did our best to engage. And not all faith groups did that. Um, but I believe that speaking to members from some of the local mosques who had food banks, um, who would give out food, who would do visits at doors, to see everyone, you know, we kept that going. I think people stepped up during the pandemic, um, Scott, because you know what? We were in crisis mm. to the degree that we've not seen in two or three generations, if not four. My mother's 96, and my mother in her 96 years of life has never heard or seen what happened over the past two or so years. And I'm sure some people will be listening now and will be saying, yes, you're right. We've never seen this. So it's a new way of living now, isn't it? You know, mm. working from home, being on Teams, being on Skype, being on um, Zoom, you know, all the media platforms now we're using. We're, we're, we're now, some of us are very savvy with that. So we have choices. Do you want to go on Teams or do you want to go on Skype or do you want to go on do you know that type of thing yeah. so it's changed i think it's changed us for for the foreseeable future really scott yeah it's sort of given us a whole new way of working hasn't it and i suppose that despite obviously the uh, the lockdown regulations that were in place given the sort of proliferation of things like 
isolation, mental health issues, for instance, that we've touched on, organizations such as yours involved in the work that you're involved in, you're probably almost like we're kept just as busy as before, if not even busier, because those issues have kind of ramped up during the pandemic and really come to the fore. But you've got all of these platforms to engage, haven't you? Indeed, indeed. So as I, as I said earlier, that crime didn't stop and violence didn't stop. Mm. Uh, in fact, some of it heightened in certain areas. Um, so we were kept busy um, during this period. You know, we've got a very small team. There's only eight of us in our team. So, you know, and if there, we don't do a 95. The 95 model or, or concept is not, it's, it's not a, so there's time 2 a.m. in the morning we could have a call. So mm. some of, me and my colleagues, we would be on call um, if there's a crisis, if we needed to call or we needed to do a, 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 a visit of some description. Um, because there are times when all people can do is just shout out help, help, help. And being solution focused, I always say that there's some solution in our toolboxes that can support people to transition or reconfigure their lives to literally get into a better space or a better mindset. But it still was a difficult period. And we haven't gone away from difficulties because working in the space where we work within the criminal justice process, I see people who have been um, brutalized in one sense. Mm. And, you know, some of them are thinking about revenge. So we've had to look at how do we mediate in this? Um, so at the, the highest end of, of criminality or violence, we're having to think through ways to engage. And because I'm a man of faith as well, you know, you start thinking about, well, where does forgiveness come into this? Where does love come into this? If someone was brutalized or someone was disrespected or someone um, was family was violated, what do you say to them about forgiveness and, 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 and loving someone? And it's a very difficult thing because the whole ethical journey you know, in Islam, halal and haram, or in Christianity, you know, the goodness and and good and evil, we have to always contend with these things every day. Um, so as an organization, we always have something we call check-in. So we meet on a Monday for our team meetings, Monday and Friday. And we always check in, how are you doing really? It's important. And this is a, a trauma-informed approach. How are you doing? Because if a member of staff is struggling, then they won't um, be at their maximum potential, really. So we always ask, everyone has to check in. How are you doing? How's it going? How are you feeling? How's your health? How's family? How's this? How's that? And so, so that's the model that we use um, to, to continually cope through this um, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. And I can imagine that given the experiences that you had prior to COVID, you, given that you were no stranger to crisis situations, you were in probably the best possible place to kind of deal with that kind of ramped up demand for the work that you do. Um, but moving on from that, um, reflecting on the last couple of years, is there anything nonetheless that you feel like you sort of have learnt as an organisation from this experience that you will take forward? I, I think there are, there are a number of things, really, or two or three things. So, firstly, what we learned from this is about the need to be very transparent about the realities of the challenge. So, there's no quick fixes. So, we learned that you have got to be transparent with each other. If you're struggling and you're thinking, you know what, you know the, the, the issue about do you have um, the COVID jab? or don't you? Mm. So that was an issue for some, and, and it still caused some ri friction with certain people in families. So we learned it's important to be as transparent as you need to be because it's in knowing all the issues then we can deal with, well, how do we respond to that? Secondly, the notion of partnership became 
more important. So when we're working with the probation service and communicating, partnership and communication is was crucial, whether it's through teams, emails, conversationing, it became more important. You know, we couldn't take it for granted that everything was known if we don't talk about it, especially because some um, workers weren't able to see other people, you know, so they would be ringing them. But because you couldn't see people on a phone, unless you, even with FaceTime, you, you can't see people's reactions to certain things. So we learned that it's important that face-to-face engagement are, as it were, more important than just the phone. Um, because with the men and the women that we work with, there's times that they deceive us. And on the phone, you can have a voice that says everything's going to go. But if you see them, you can think, yeah, no, they're not looking so good today. You know, look at the way they're dressed. Look at So we learned that as well, the need for face-to-faces, um, because you could miss aspects of the challenge if you are not in a face-to-face situation. Mm-hmm. So we struggled a little bit with that. Uh, for those people who didn't want to, to, to have a face-to-face. I think thirdly is in relation to strategic thinking. What we learned is the need to have an inter-agency and interdisciplinary approach to this. What do I mean? So we learned more about public health, didn't we? You know, um, and what it is to ask some critical questions within the public health framework. So the public health framework offers us people of faith and non-faith a framework to ask critical questions together. We learned that to be able to say, let's work together. You may not be a person of faith, but I am so, but we're equally important in our conversation to say, what is the challenge here? What's the problem? So public health said, you ask it, what is the problem? Then you ask them the next question, who is involved with this? When did it start? Who's the best person placed to respond to this aspect? So if you don't work in partnership, you see, then it becomes lopsided, doesn't it? Because then you won't have certain other solutions that's required. So some of these things, we're, it's ongoing learning. You know, we're lifelong learners, um, Scott. Hmm. Um, I think what is important for me is the legitimacy of looking at faith-based approaches because historically people have been very cautious about what it is, you know, um, to talk about faith-based approaches um, because people at one point were thinking, you, you, are you there to proselytize? Are you there to tell people to come to your faith? I think over the pandemic, that's been, there's been a shift more. It's more of a public theological perspective. That means that what is our, in our theological or faith toolboxes that can be for the public good. And I think we worked well over this period together. So we've learned, we've learned a lot and the learning is ongoing, um, Scott. Yeah, of course, Carver. I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that we never are a finished product in that respect. Every single day is a school day and there's always something more to uh, to learn. That's absolutely right. And, I think, um, as you sort of touched on um, a little bit earlier as well, this sort of increased awareness of our own physical health, our own mental health. I mean, despite the tragedy that it's taken for that awareness to really be kind of thrust into us, we it, there are some positives to take from that, aren't there? Given that we know we, we value our mental health more, we look out for the mental health of uh, the colleagues that we work with ourselves more, the people yeah. that we work yeah. with, and there's a lot to take yeah. from that. There, there, there is indeed. Um, what goes back to what I was saying about our own response was the checking in of every member of staff twice a week. Mm. So the value of health, we, we say in our, so our framework of checking is body, soul, and spirit. What I mean by that, so how are you physically? How are you emotionally, which is a soul? And how are you, you know, ethically? How, how is everything going for you? So we, we check in on those three levels, really. Um, so we've explained to our staff what that, what that means. Um, and mental health, having good mental health is 
crucial um, because I know people during this this period that went down and they're still um, recovering um, from some of the, the challenges that they faced during this period. And it's important that we don't become complacent now in that we are not on the lockdown, but we, some of us are still locked down in our minds. I know people now that still struggle to go out um, and struggle to be in spaces because of their mental health issues in terms of how the pandemic impacted them. So I'm talking to one or two of them at this point in time. Mm-hmm. And not to say, you know, you need to feel more liberated, but to say, you know what, why are you feeling what you're feeling still? What do you think that is? And just to navigate through some solutions for them. So. Yeah, and I think it's going to be needed because I don't think the real scale of the issue is going to become apparent uh, still for many, many months uh, because there are still people who are sort of being uncovered that have slipped through the net who are experiencing these issues. So let us hope that they do sort of find that healing that they uh, that they need very soon indeed. And thinking about the uh, the future in that respect and what bringing hope is going to be focusing on now that we're out of the acute phase of the pandemic but we're dealing with of course rampant inflation and a huge cost of living crisis um what carver would you say that the next 12 months holds for your organization just before we uh, we finish up on the show today okay thank you Scott. so bringing hope we have just moved into our new bringing hope hub Mm. And we are establishing that hub as a space, as a resource space for there to be people to come to us, for us to support them in whichever way we can that we could be a signpost in. But therapeutic work will happen there. Um, People will come to consider their lifestyle and their development for the future. So we hope that this will be a dynamic space um, of hope um, because we call it the Hope Hub, where there'll be time for young people, individuals and families to come. There'll be time when we will literally just have family gatherings to look at, well, how are you doing really? So it's, and and inviting um, the statutory voluntary and faith sectors. So we just want to develop this hub of hope uh, for the next 12 months. That's what we're drilling down on at the moment. So our staff are excited about our new space um, where we work from. So we're just literally taking time to go in. And on the 8th of um, July, we're having an official opening um, of our um, hub amazing 8th of july certainly want to uh, to put in the diary if you're around uh, the uh, the birmingham west midlands area for sure and uh I would love, actually, um, Carver, just given how sort of enlightening it's been having you join us on the show today to even sort of catch up at some point in the next year and just see sort of how successful that new hub is and just talk about some of the amazing that work be, that it's doing. Yeah, That would be really, really good, um, Scott. So it's really a pleasure to speak with you today. So you take care now and hope all the listeners you take care too. Thank you, Scott. Mm, Absolutely right. And I would like to reiterate that message to everybody tuning in as well. I do hope that you've all thoroughly enjoyed the interview with Reverend Dr. Carver Anderson from Bringing Hope today. And uh, to anybody else who is uh, listening into the uh, the podcast who might feel that your own organisation has its own story to share with us, then by all means, we also want to hear from you. So you too can apply to be on the show via leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply if you would like to share that with us. Um, Until next time, to every single one of our regular listeners, please do take care and goodbye.